the Shit Gets Real podcast. I'm Rietta. And I'm Connie. And today we are here with Danny Rosenblatt James. I might have, you know, screwed up the middle part because that's the Swedish and I am no uh, linguist. So, Danny, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you deal when the shit gets real. Thanks for having me on here. So, as you said, I am Danny Rosenblad James. Um, originally, I'm from the U.S., so South Dakota, and I moved to Sweden. Let's see, about five years ago. It was for love. I fell in love with a Swede, and he whisked me away from the U.S. to Sweden. Um, I love it. Yeah. And so I have a travel blog called Misfit Wanders. I'm also an influencer, a mom of a two and a half year old. And let's see, I am writing a book that is loosely based on my traumatic brain injury. And I think that wraps it up. Oh, I'm also a sustainable travel expert. That's, so that's awesome. Get it. Me in a nutshell. <laughs> Do you ever miss the US? I have to know. To be honest, I think I sometimes miss the nature in certain areas. However, I don't really miss it that much since I live in Sweden and there's nature, abundance of nature everywhere. Plus, it's easy just to go to any other country since Europe is right here. Um, And my family and friends, yeah, I do miss them. But now we're in a day and age where we have technology, so that helps a lot. (laughs) Absolutely. So where is your favorite place that you've ever been? Let's see. I think my favorite of all time would have to be my first solo trip that I went on um, to meet up with my husband, who was my friend at the time, and that was uh, to Peru. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Oh, both me and Rihanna. Ooh, at the same time. <laughs> I want to do all the traveling. It just hasn't happened yet because my husband's in the military and we only do the traveling we're allowed to do. So whenever I do get to go places that I want to go, I know who I'm asking. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Good. I am here. <laughs> um. So have you always had a passion for travel or did that just desire grow as you moved around and got older or how did that mm-hmm. come about? So I actually grew up um, going on a lot of road trips since I have family all over the States. So just growing up with that already made me really enjoy traveling. Um, And then I think I was, let's see, 17, um, maybe even younger than that. And my parents actually took me to St. Martin, an island. And that was (laughs) interesting However, we pretty much just stayed in touristy areas, and it was a very tiny, tiny island, so it was easy to see everything all at once. Um, And then after that, I think a year or two later, we went to Aruba, which is beautiful and everything, but I think the the locals there, 90% of them work for tourism, so it's very much for tourists. So it's another thing. Like nowadays, I love traveling to get into the culture, to have all of these experiences, to be around locals, um, and of course, to see the nature, because I'm a huge fan of nature. (laughs) So are you into hiking, just like our um, co-host or whatever, Brietta? Yes, definitely. So my uh, travel blog... It's dedicated to hikes and outdoor adventures in Sweden. And then I've been branching out to other countries as well. Oh, Ugh. okay. Yeah, I'm definitely going to be reading all your blog because Sweden is very <laughs> high on my list because a lot of my family is from there. So, um, yeah, I definitely will be checking out your blog. That sounds awesome. I love it. I love that you blog about your outdoor adventures. That's so fun. <laughs> what, what's your favorite hike? Oh, my favorite hike. Oh, man, just Such one? a hard question. <laughs> it, it really mm-hmm. is. Honestly. Top I, five. I don't uh, care. <laughs> um, I think it would probably be many of the hikes that I went on in Norway. I did the pulpit rock there, and that was phenomenal. So beautiful. And it wasn't that hard. Um, the views, oh, my gosh. And the same for 
uh, Trolltunga, uh, the troll's tongue. This is a very famous one in mm-hmm. Norway. And we actually did that one off season. So there wasn't as many people. I think there was maybe 10 people in front of us to take a photo on the troll's tongue, which that's not usual. It's usually like waiting for an hour or two. And I was oh hearing that and oh I was God. like, that's crazy. Cause it's super cold up there. <laughs> the snow and yeah. whatnot. <laughs> that's wild. Um, I'm with you. I don't like doing the popular hikes because then you don't actually feel like you're hiking because you're just surrounded by a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why we're down to do those on the off season. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Smart. Mm -hmm. But then it gets hard because eventually when a place gets popular enough, there is no off season. No matter when, you know what I mean? When it gets in enough popularity, it's like, okay, there's people on this hike all the time yeah although that can be a little different on certain hikes because of the weather so it's just it's too Mm -hmm. dangerous to try to take the hike on certain times because of the weather so the people that do that end up having to take a helicopter (laughs) oh my gosh wow Mm -hmm. yeah you definitely don't want to go down that road Mm -hmm. um so did your love of travel and all that is that a part of how you started hitchhiking or are those on the same path or did you just do that separately? (laughs) All right. That started from um, not getting along with my sister on a road trip and I had it and I was ready to get on the road. And I'd already been kind of contemplating on trying hitchhiking before that anyways. So my friend and I and my dog started hitchhiking and then I had hitched hitchhiked for about a year on the west coast were you ever afraid of hitchhiking because i know in this day and age it's like really frowned upon it's like Mm. no 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 hitchhiking no picking up hitchhiking yeah i mean i don't i don't think i was really scared of it because i've always liked to do things out of the box i like to be out of my comfort zone um plus i think Mm -hmm. since i was little i've always learned how to follow my gut And with hitchhiking, you have to decide if this person's good or bad within like 10 seconds of like uh, walking up to their vehicle. And there were definitely times where I said, oh, no, thank you. And one of those times I did that, I said that because the guy said he didn't have space in the back for the guy I was traveling with and my dog. And all he had in the backseat were like a couple pillows or something. And so I was like, oh, no, thank you. I'll pass. And he got so angry. (laughs) And I was Mm. like, okay, definitely. No, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. No. Mm. Yeah. 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 That was going to be my next question is if like you did ever have a scenario where you're like, nope, this person is clearly a little not all there. Yeah. So I'm glad you answered that. Yeah. I've had um, a couple. (laughs) Yeah, our grandpa was definitely the kind of guy that would pick up hitchhikers and he would help everybody. Like, because we would get us all the snow up here in the Northwest. I mean, not Northwest, Midwest. Where am I? And he would, every time there was um, a blizzard, he would go and drive and tow people out. And then it came to a point where grandma said, You have to stop. You're too old and you could get taken advantage of real easily. You're not a young buck anymore. Yeah, I definitely have had to get some rides from the ditch (laughs) in the Midwest. (laughs) Yeah. Is that where your blog all started from? Was your traveling and your hitchhiking and all that that you just kind of wanted to share that? Or did that really not start until you got to Sweden? Since I know you said your main thing was sharing Swedish hikes. Yeah, um, I actually started it as a personal journal when I was in Peru. Because I wanted to remember my stories and all those things. And then it was, I think, a couple years later, I had learned that, oh, this could be a travel blog. I could turn this into something where I can help inspire people and let them know more about my stories and experiences. And so that's when it started forming into that. And it was after time 
over a few years learning and experiencing, um, experimenting with the travel blog that I turned it into being more dedicated to Sweden. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I think you should write one about the proper way to hitchhike for the people that want to try it. Uh, yeah, I think that's. I think that'd be a hit. Oh my god, yes, <laughs> especially in this modern age. Yeah. Um, yeah, because me personally, it terrifies me. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I don't know if I would recommend it in this day and age, though, <laughs> because I know how dangerous it has gotten, especially in the states. I mean, I my when I went back to the states to visit family and friends. My husband stayed back here with our son because that was too far of a trip for him being so young. Um, so I went back and he told me under no circumstances, can you hitchhike? I was like, oh, OK. Yeah. Because, I mean, we get to hear about all the gun <laughs> shootings and all of these things. And this yeah. is just unheard of in Sweden. Love that your husband's got your back. He's like, no, ma'am, no, none of that nonsense oh, anymore. No, my husband would be like, hell no. What, what? No, get in your car and drive, lady. You're out of your mind because, like, he gets upset if in the garage my car is sitting unlocked. He like just now was like, well, I guess it's okay for the car to be unlocked in the garage because safety is like he's super paranoid about it all. <laughs> why why is he like that uh too much news i guess like too many shootings too much like violence i mean and it was probably more warranted in our old neighborhood where a shooting literally took place a half a mile from my house um and that was right before we moved um, so, I mean, I guess that's why. And then plus there was all the rioting in Chicago. Like, I don't know. It's just over time with things that, that have happened in the Chicagoland area. He's just like, no, safety is the number one priority. So you suffered a TBI or a traumatic brain injury. So how did that happen? I hope it wasn't while you were hiking. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it was from a seven car pileup. So, um, oh my oh goodness. My goodness. <laughs> I was on my way. So I was in South Dakota and I was on my way to Northern Cali to work on the weed farm where I worked for five years. <laughs> and um, I was in Wyoming and there was black ice on the in interstate. And it was so bad that I actually stayed the night at a hotel. Um, so the next day I went out and I started driving on the interstate again. And I was like, Ah, they would close these if they were really bad. Well, turns out, no. So um, it was a semi truck that was drop like blocking all of the lanes, and visibility was less than a mile. Then it was black ice, so oh you goodness. can't really stop. So all I mm -hmm. remember is going, "Oh shit!" And it was my dog and I in my little pickup truck. So I guess mm -hmm. I went on autopilot tried to go around, veered to the right, ended up clipping one of the vehicles, and my <laughs> my truck turned into a convertible. Had no top anymore. Oh my goodness. I got a gash oh my goodness. on my head. Um and then we spun 360 and then the back of my truck got hit. So I was actually the last one on the scene, which is very good and I'm very fortunate for since I was also the most badly damaged from the accident. Um, so the sheriff Whoa, came to wow. me and I had blood gashing, like coming out of my head and I was covered in it. I was very lucky that it was so cold. So I didn't have to have a blood transfusion. Um, mm -hmm. And he called the helicopter to come get me so i had to be helicoptered to salt lake city utah and be in the icu there for 10 days and they also induced me in a coma wow. as well and thankfully my wow. dog was okay oh well that's great mm. who ended up like coming and like taking care of your dog oh so my parents they got a nice knock on the door from a sheriff which 
<laughs> my father had told me this story several times. The sheriff told them, like, oh, you probably should need to see a pre- priest before you do anything else. And so then, then he explains a little bit more of it. And then my father drops to his knees. And my mom is more calm and collective because she's a retired nurse. So she's started getting their things ready to go and trying to figure out their next move. Yeah. Um, and so they decided to drive to me because that was the fastest way. They couldn't wait for a flight. Um, and my yeah. best friend came with them as well. So they came to me, I think, within a day or two of the accident. And they How far away were dog. they? Um, so Sioux Falls, South Dakota from Wyoming. It was in a small place. I can't actually remember the name of the town. I think it was, you know, at least a uh, half a day. No, no, no. Maybe. Uh, I can't remember exactly. It was quite a drive, though. But it was a good, it was a decent track, yeah, to get to you. Definitely. And, like, what, like, the sheriff was just, like, holding your dog while you're in the ICU? No. I, I, I know they're not going to let the, the dog into the ICU. No, okay. he was he was in a animal shelter for the time being. Oh. Um, and then oh, okay. when my parents came to pick him up, they actually said, oh, no charge, no charge, because they heard about how bad the accident was. And that's actually the oh, same well, that's thing. Nice. That's yeah. nice. And that's actually the same thing that happened with my truck because they had to tow it away from there. And we actually checked it out when I finally was released from the hospital. And the guy, my he was talking to my father saying, oh, how is she doing? And I was outside looking at the truck at the time. And my dad's like, oh, she's fine. She's right over there. And the guy's just like, his drop, jaw drops. And he's just like, what? He's like, yeah, you guys don't need to pay anything. Like, you don't need to worry about this. That's amazing that she's able to walk. Because he's because all he saw was the oh. truck and how it was a convertible now. <laughs> and couldn't believe that yeah. the person in it had survived. Plus, I was told if I was taller, I would have been decapitated. And then later yeah. on, months later... I got a call from that sheriff just to check in on me. He found out where I was at, and he told me that I fractured my neck. So I was very close to becoming paralyzed for the rest of my life. Wow. So it's a, That's a wild. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, the one time in, the, in your life that you're thankful that you're short, mm-hmm. <laughs> or yeah. shorter. Mm-hmm. Were you ever told, like, well, if you were in a smaller car, you wouldn't be here. Like, was it also like a good thing that you were in a truck as well? Or like, not sure that that would have mattered? Um, I don't know. I don't remember that ever being mentioned. I think it was more that they were just trying to make me feel like just work on healing. Mm-hmm. Um but I'm yeah. pretty sure that a lot of those doctors that I saw thought I was going to be messed up for the rest of my life because they never mentioned, oh, wow. you'll get better or anything like this. It was kind of like one day at a time, yeah. slow and steady. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How long were you in the hospital for? So uh, when I was in Salt Lake City, that was for 10 days in ICU. And then I passed my test. They had to help me learn how to re how to walk again um my equilibrium was crap so i couldn't really stand without falling over i couldn't be in oh my goodness a dark room without falling over um and some of the tests they made me do i call are like common common sense tests because it's like they put me in a kitchen and made sure that i turned off the stove and that i used oven mitts when you need them and all these little things that you don't really think of Wow, that's I didn't even know like they did tests like that. That's mm-hmm. interesting, but good thing you passed them. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The doctor didn't seem too thrilled about letting me leave though. <laughs> really? Yeah, I think he wanted Why? I think it was just cuz he was nervous cuz I also wanted to heal naturally. I wasn't taking any, any medication. I wasn't I didn't want to have any pain reliever because I know me and I know that I would have overdone it and I would have hurt myself in the long run because I would have overdone it. 
Okay. Well, well that's, a, that's a valid thing. Yeah. I mean, you knew yourself and you knew what you were capable of. So that's really awesome. Mm-hmm. But um, it makes sense that the doctor was also worried about you. You know, he just wants you to yeah. do well. Um, healing wise, how long do you feel that it took or do you feel like you're still healing? I think it was after five years. I think that is as healed as I would be. Um, I still have issues with my memory and pain in my head here and there, but that's usually because of stress or dehydration or the barometer. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, do you remember having any um, hallucinations? My friend got hit in the head with a radiator, mm-hmm. and like he's like missing a piece of his skull, like right Oof. here. And um, he hallucinated that Kevin Hart was taking him to get an MRI. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I just think it's freaking hilarious. (laughs) It's like, it's not hilarious. It was like really scary. But it's like, wait, Kevin Hart, what are you doing here? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I actually would see um, when I'd be staring at something and I would look at another Mm -hmm. spot, I would see the silhouette of that same image just in like the river mm-hmm. mirror um, of your eyesight and the peripherals. Mm. Sorry, I was thinking of like a car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and then I actually, because I had to see an eye doctor about about it, and she ex- she explained to me that one of her other um, customers had only seen yellow, like everything was in yellow. And that's just, it's just wow. one of, the, it's just everyone heals differently because the brain is already such a complex thing that it works differently for everyone. Interesting. That's amazing. I don't know how I would feel about seeing everything in yellow. I mean, I guess you have no say, but I mean, that, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did that, and, and that ended up fixing itself over time, right? Yeah. With the silhouette, seeing that. Yeah. It went away. Mm-hmm. I can't remember how long it had lasted. I know that the first two years of healing, I didn't feel like me, and that was horrible. Yeah. How did you help yourself deal with that, not feeling like yourself? I mean, two years is a long time. Yeah, I think Mm -hmm. it was that I had the mentality that I wasn't where I'm I'm going to be in the future in a way. So I was like, I saw, oh, this isn't me is kind of in my mind. Like, yeah, what's happening right now, what I'm going through, this isn't me. I'm already over there. And so I already saw a light at the end of the tunnel of all my healing. And I think that's what kept Mm -hmm. helping me go forward. Plus, I am super stubborn. So that was very helpful as well. (laughs) I never felt or I didn't feel like myself after having a kid for like a year because of like your um, TBI. Did you have that like issue too? because of the brain injury like would that make it worse <laughs> so what what do you mean do you mean like when i was pregnant as well with the tbi like, or? like after you had a baby yeah after you had a baby like did you feel like yourself or did you feel like this isn't me this isn't my body this is not my life because sometimes it felt like that for me yeah Ooh, i know that i definitely felt like i was overwhelmed with emotions all the time yeah. and it was like the that time. for oh a yeah. year. So that definitely mm-hmm. didn't feel like me, but it didn't feel the same as when I had my TBI yeah. when I was healing with that. That's completely different because I felt foggy in the head, frustrated. It felt empty within me. It's really difficult oh, to God, yeah. fully explain, but it's like some of my friends would say some jokes and they would all laugh and I would just be standing there and they're like, hmm, she usually would know and understand and some other friends were telling me that I was acting like a teenager mind you I had the accident when I was 24 so it's pretty big different yeah (laughs) it is a big difference because I even think about myself back when I was like 24 25 Mm -hmm. and I thought then that I was very mature and had come a long way but now at 37 almost 38 I look back at me at 24 and I'm like I had no idea what I was doing yeah (laughs) Oh, the age. <laughs> so you're writing a book. Oh, yes. How did you turn your TBI stuff into a book? 
Um, so I've been on quite a few podcasts, and it seems like my TBI is something that many people want to hear about. They want to be inspired, re- uh, learn about what I've overcome and where I am uh, today. So this is a huge Absolutely. reason that I've wanted to put this book out there that's more like a narrative, loosely based story on my traumatic brain injury. And what are going to be some of your key hopeful takeaways from this book? Like, obviously, we don't want you to give too much away, but at least <laughs> just some main things that you're hoping will really help people. I, th- I really hope that it helps people realize that life can be difficult. But if you just keep striving to get better, to go forward, you can do it. I mean, look at me. I am an influencer, a travel blogger, a sustainable travel expert. I, am, I have my child. I'm also studying Spanish, and I'm stu- I'm actually studying to become an English teacher. I didn't mention all that. <laughs> so, That's awesome. So I'm quite busy, and my mind is working really good since I can do multiple things. Absolutely. So what is a su- sustainable travel expert? I can't say it now oh, either. Sorry. Um, I don't think I've ever I don't think I've ever heard that term before. Maybe maybe I'm just not familiar enough. Yeah, with it. sustainable um travel expert. Okay, that just means pretty much eco-friendly, eco-conscious when traveling. So mm-hmm. let's say you're wanting to travel to a place um and you're not quite familiar with it or you're not really sure how to go about doing it, then I would suggest um doing Airbnbs, uh, eating at local restaurants, um, looking into researching the tourism companies. um, And if you're going to go to an animal sanctuary, research that first to make sure that it's actually um, ethical. And the same thing with like the tourism companies, make sure that they actually are caring about the environment, that they're not hurting it more than anything else. Helping it. Or anything, yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know what always blew my mind, or what blew my mind anyway, when I went to Hawaii to visit Rietta, Mm -hmm. and we were on, like, the main strip of Waikiki, and there's a million different restaurants, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, like, local places, and what is there but a two-plus-hour wait at the Cheesecake Factory? Uh And I'm like, you can go there anywhere. Why are you in Hawaii going to the Cheesecake Factory when there's like a million restaurants that are way more local than that? Yeah. And like the line for it and like how many people were just sitting outside of their doors waiting just every day blew my mind. Yeah. I was like, what what, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> However, that's how we are as humans. We like things that are normal to us. That we know. And a lot of people don't like to go out of their comfort zone. And that's why I think sustainability hasn't been so high on a lot of people's radars. Because they Mm kind of have to go out of their comfort zones in order to be around like the locals or to get more into their customs and things like that. Yeah, so the thing that blew my mind about Hawaii is... Um, you hear about the plastic pandemic, but when you actually go to the beach and you see all those things on the beach, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually <laughs> gave a speech to the guy at Costco the other day because like, I guess if I signed up for something, he was like, oh, we'll give you a free pack of water. And I'm like, I don't buy bottled water because I lived in Hawaii. And you know what the number one thing I saw on the beach besides straws was? Plastic lids to the plastic water bottles. Yeah. So no, thank you. And then he was like, mm, I didn't expect to get all that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's like my my yeah. number one thing I tell people is have a reusable water bottle water with you bottle. when you're traveling. Like Always. I have a metal a metal one with me, and then it's like if you travel to a place where you can't drink the water, bring a water filter with you. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I even have one of those um, like iodine straws. Mm-hmm. Like when I'm hiking, like if I happen to like if some crazy situation happens, like I can just stick it in a stream mm-hmm. and drink the water like yeah it won't it's not perfect but it's better than just drinking straight water out of the stream yeah oh yeah in uh, sweden you can drink the water here though (laughs) 
They have very I love clean it. water. I mean, that's fantastic. <laughs> All the I more love- reasons to go to Sweden. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I loved that about um, Rome is that all of their fountains that look decorative Mm -hmm. are actually for like human consumption. And I loved that. Mm -hmm. It was the best thing because we had water bottles and it was like our first day on our first tour. Like the tour guide was like, basically all of these fountains, they are decorative and you might see people go and use them. And that's because it's actually usable and they're not even modern at all whatsoever like they're from like roman like ancient rome yeah i'm like that's wild (laughs) to me but i love it (laughs) since we're back on traveling and I, i love a good travel story what is some uh what's one of your favorite travel stories and then maybe one i don't want to say like your least favorite but maybe one where you like learned a life lesson oh that's a good one brianna I try. Um, so I think I'm going to probably come back to Peru. And I think it was when I did Colco Canyon. I did the hike down to the Colco Canyon. And it was when I met an American girl and an Australian lady. Oh, man. That was... So back then, I was not very good at buying good shoes. So I just (laughs) bought, what, $20 shoes and used them to hike down there. Well, what happened was they melted. (laughs) What? Yes. So trying to walk back up with melted shoes, that was quite interesting. Melted shoes. Oh, my God. Yeah. They were not very good. I have so many questions. I bought them when I was in Peru, <laughs> so I don't know. How do how do shoes melt? It was, like, was it just the rubber? It, yeah, it was the rubber that melted, and I think it was because it was so hot. And oh my gosh, that literally blows my mind. Yeah. And now I'm picturing you with, like, lava feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely was uh, an experience, that's for sure. <laughs> Did you end up just taking them off and going barefoot or did you just deal with your melted shoes? Yeah, I think I just dealt with it because I think it would have been better to have the melted shoes than be barefoot because my feet would not be able to handle the heat if the melted if my shoes melted. Oh. <laughs> Touche. Touche. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we learned that we need good shoes. All right. Do you have okay. any shoe recommendations yes, since we're say, there? I love shoe recommendations. <laughs> yes, Solomon. <laughs> That's like my go-to. Oh, I've heard them. Yeah, Solomon are good shoes for sure. They're very good. Um, and some other ones, there's Vikings, but I think that's more for men. Um, yeah, and then Merrill. I, I don't know if that's how you say it. Merrill? Mer- that's yeah. another really good one. Yeah, I think it's Merrill. Yeah. It's Merrill. I think oh, so. I think those it's are my, hus- I think those you're are right. my husband's favorite. Oh, good. And then there's Obas. And miendo. Mm-hmm. I guess I had a few. <laughs> hey, we'll take all the recommendations you can get. So She's was always that your favorite and your your lesson all in one? Like, was that all one or do you still have a favorite? Or is it still Peru? Uh, I mean, it always seems to go back to Peru just because of all the different experiences I had there. I mean, we stayed in the Amazons for three nights we fished for fish with machetes. We caught eight. We um, what? Yeah, That's amazing. So cool. Yeah, we got to um, be in a canoe and go swimming in the Amazons. We also got to watch one of our tour guides jump out of the canoe in the middle of the night, come back in the canoe with a caiman. And that's like a little alligator. And I'm just like, what? where's the mom? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, there's, and they also got a sloth down from the tree one time and everything some, seemed to come back to if we wanted to eat it and they only spoke Spanish and I didn't know Spanish at the time either. And we had, we actually have a very good friend that we met on this trip that invited us to go on this tour with him. And he was our little translator, our German buddy. <laughs> and yeah, so <laughs> I guess the tour guides kept saying, oh, comer, comer, you want to eat? So it's like the sloth comes down. They're like, oh, you want to eat it? The caiman, you want to eat it? And then we hear monkeys. Oh, you want to eat? We're like, oh. (laughs) 
Please don't kill the little sloth. I know. Did you pet the sloth? That would be oh, cool. yes. I don't know if you would pet a sloth. Yeah, I totally did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Are they as wiry as they look? I feel like he looks kind of like wiry. Yeah. I think I remember it being pretty wiry feeling. And then, oh, yeah, I also went to Bolivia after Peru. And I went into one of the most deadliest mines, um, I think, in the world. It was in Potosi. And it's a wow. silver mine. And if you work in those mines, your life expectancy is pretty low. I think it's like maybe 40s or 50s. Because of what's in there? I'm assuming it must be fume related and not yeah, it's, collapsing related? Yeah, it's collapsing related um, gas and, it's, and just breathing all know. the fumes. And it's just hard labor. Of course, my husband, that was my friend at the time, um, had to work with them because he loves doing that. So he like worked with them for a week and he was trying to do all this hard labor with them. But all the mines are sh- for short people. <laughs> so he had to bend over to like push, <laughs> push everything around. And he became the fun one to see in the mines with the uh, tour guides because he was the white guy. <laughs> Oh That's my god! And a, like, it's not like he just did a day. He did a whole week. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing while he was mining his life away? Oh, so when we were in Peru, we met up f- for a week and traveled together, and then we traveled separately. And so it was only a couple years. Ah, okay. Yeah, it was mm-hmm. only a couple years ago. I had learned that he kept going out of his way to keep meeting up with me. <laughs> just like, oh, oh that is so yeah. cute. <laughs> Yeah, and I was just like, oh, that's weird. We're in the same area, huh? Because so many of the people at the hostels were going around the same pl- uh, paths and stuff. So that's what I thought was happening with him. Nope. <laughs> okay. Oh. Um, future book idea, your romance story of him like randomly popping up would be very cute. Just throwing it out there. I think he's going to be a little Plus, bit mixed. Plus, you can have like, all in this the- info. <laughs> <laughs> Different names, you know, do it like how Rietta did it, where it's like it's loosely based on your romance, you know? <laughs> Only like kind of. You can throw in some like other fun stuff. I don't know. I'm not the writer Rietta is. She'll tell you, uh, yeah, uh, everything you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> All right, do you have anything else to share with our listeners? I just would have to say that you should just stay positive. Um, always see the better side of things instead of the worst. Absolutely. That's I love that. why me and uh, Tom work out because I'm always Mrs. Positive and he's, you know, Mr. Security over there. <laughs> I lighten him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for joining us. It's been fun. Thanks yeah, for thank having you. Me. All right. Well, this is how to deal when the shit gets real and we'll see y'all next episode.